At one time, the television series American Horror Story was all the rage. No doubt you've heard of it. In season three, known as American Horror Story Coven, Kathy Bates plays the character Madame Delphine LaLaurie, a voodoo practitioner and serial killer, someone that was dug up from an unmarked 180-year-old grave and is still alive to bring her horrors to the modern world. Did you know Delphine LaLaurie was a real person? Well, she was. And she was someone that was more dark and twisted than even that show could reveal. Everyone loves a good, strange, weird, or bizarre story. Well, welcome to the American South, where dark legends and haunted history lurk around every corner. Where superstition, folklore, and a touch of backwoods magic blend with everyday culture, some say, in order to survive. This is Dixie After Dark. In 1730, Irishman Bartholomew McCarthy and his French bride immigrated to the United States, settling in the European Creole community of New Orleans. After shortening the family name to McCarty, they engaged in many profitable ventures and quickly became very prominent people in New Orleans. There they had five children, one of which was born Marie Delphine McCarty on March 19, 1787. The family continued their rise in power. One of Delphine's uncles, Esteban Rodriguez Miro, became governor, and a cousin, Augustine de McCarty, became mayor of New Orleans from 1815 to 1820. Other family members were all wealthy merchants or army officials. At just 13 years old, Delphine was married to Don Ramon, a high-ranking Spanish official. While a large part of New Orleans was still under Spanish occupation, her husband was appointed Consul General of Spain, making Delphine one of the most powerful women in the state. In 1804, Don Ramon received orders to take place at court as benefiting of his new position. So Don Ramon and a now pregnant Delphine left New Orleans, headed for Spain. During a pause in Cuba, Don Ramon got sick and died, just days before his daughter would be born. Once recovered from childbirth, Delphine and the new baby returned to New Orleans. In 1808, Delphine married again to Jean Blanc, a merchant, banker, lawyer, and one of the richest men in the region. He bought them a house on Royal Street in New Orleans, which became known as a Villa Blanc. They had four children together, and Delphine continued to be a figure of high society. After eight years of marriage, though, Jean Blanc died. Delphine remained a widow for the next nine years before meeting a young doctor newly arrived from France, Dr. Leonard LaLaurie. The couple married on June 12, 1825, although the doctor was 20 years younger than Delphine. Since he was a busy doctor, though, Leonard was not always around. Delphine took it upon herself to purchase a three-story mansion at 1140 Royal Street in the French Quarter, complete with an attached slave quarter to occupy her time. There she lived with two of her daughters and continued to maintain her position in New Orleans high society. The LaLauries kept several slaves in their attached quarters in public, Delphine was said to have been generally polite to black people and even concerned for her slave's own health. 
In fact, she is even known to have freed two of her slaves, once in 1819 and again in 1832. For whatever reason though, the Lolores began having marital issues. Neighbors reported hearing loud arguments coming from the home, ultimately leading to the couple parting ways in 1832. Leonard moved out, leaving the mansion and everything inside to Delphine. It seems that now, after three failed attempts at marital bliss, Delphine went mad. British social theorist and writer Harriet Martineau wrote that she had witnessed Delphine's slave to be, quote, singularly haggard and wretched. She also wrote that rumors about Delphine's mistreatment of slaves were so rampant that lawyers visited the property to remind Delphine of the laws on slave upkeep. During that visit, though, no evidence of wrongdoing or mistreatment was found. Two other reports of mistreatment found to be true, though. One slave jumped from a third-story window, saying to prefer death over torture. The window was later cemented shut and remain so even today. The other report was of a 12-year-old slave girl named Leah. Leah was brushing Delphine's hair one day and pulled a little too hard for Delphine's liking. It's said that Delphine flew into a rage and severely beat the girl. The beating was so bad that Leah climbed onto the roof and jumped to her death. Delphine was caught trying to bury the body in secret. According to the law of the day, Delphine was fined $300 and forced to sell off nine of her slaves. She complied, but a loophole in the law was not prepared for someone of Delphine's wealth and status. The police could do nothing when Delphine immediately purchased back those same nine slaves. She had complied with the law as it was written, after all. Funeral registers between 1830 and 1834 document the deaths of 12 slaves at the Lolori Mansion, although the cause of death was never documented. Then, things seemed to have reached their breaking point. On the afternoon of April 10th, 1834, the Lolori mansion caught fire. When authorities busted in to try to contain the fire, they found the cook, a 70-year-old slave woman, chained to the stove at the ankle. Delphine didn't care. She was rushing through the house trying to save her valuables instead. The police freed the elderly slave. But rather than flee the house, she rushed the police upstairs to the attic. The slave woman knew that this was her only chance at answers, because the attic was known to be a place that slaves went, but never returned from. There, they discovered seven slaves, tied up, each bound with spiked iron collars. The police started freeing the slaves before the fire could spread, and that's when they discovered how bad a shape they were really in. They were mutilated with deformed limbs. Some had their intestines pulled from their abdomens, but tied around their bodies, somehow still alive. Aside from the seven slaves, they also found discarded corpses and mutilated body parts. Others were found chained in their quarters. These accounts can be found in the New Orleans Bee article published on April 11, 1834. Once the fire had been put out, the 70-year-old slave woman confessed to setting the fire herself. She was so afraid of punishment from Delphine that she would rather be burned alive. People that had helped free and save the slaves from the fire were outraged, 
and five days later a mob charged the LaLaurie mansion. The local sheriff could not contain the crowd and sent a company of United States regulars from the army to assist in controlling the mob. In all the chaos, Delphine took a carriage and escaped the city. It is said by many that Delphine escaped to the waterfront and boarded a schooner. She made her way to Mobile, Alabama, then ultimately Paris, France. While Delphine escaped, a mob of what is said to be 4,000 people descended on the mansion, tearing down the doors and bursting out all the windows. The slaves were taken to the police station, where they all made statements on their mistreatments. According to those statements, Delphine LaLaurie performed medical experiments on them. The removal of skin, breaking bones only to reset them at off angles, and even amputation. One was said to have animal feces shoved into their mouth, then their lips physically sewn shut. There's even an account of an exposed brain being poked and stirred with a stick to see how the body would respond before dying. The Pitfield Sun, citing the New Orleans Advertiser and writing several weeks after the evacuation of the Lorie's slave quarters, claimed that two of the slaves found in the mansion had died since their rescue. It added, quote, we understand that in digging the yard, bodies have been disinterred, and the condemned well inside the mansion grounds has been uncovered, particularly showing the body of a child. The slaves were shown in public as evidence, which made the mob's fury even worse. Official accounts state that Delphine LaLaurie never returned to New Orleans. Living in exile in Paris with his mother and two sisters, Delphine's son, Pauline Blanc, wrote on August 15, 1842, to his brother-in-law, stating that Delphine was serious about returning to New Orleans and had to thought about doing so for a long time. Blanc wrote in the same letter that he believed that his mother never had any idea about the reason for her departure from New Orleans. Despite Delphine's, quote, bad mood and her determination to return to New Orleans, the disapproval of her children and other relatives had apparently been enough for her to cancel her plans. Delphine managed to live a respectful and good life in Paris until the day she died. Records in Paris record her death as December 7, 1849. Strangely enough, though, in the 1930s, a cracked copper plate was found in the New Orleans St. Louis Cemetery with the name Madame Delphine McCarty Lolaurie inscribed in French, placing her death seven years earlier. With the legacy of her crimes coupled with her previous high society connections, Searches have been performed to confirm one or the other. To this day, the true remains of Madame Delphine LaLaurie have never been identified. The LaLaurie mansion sat damaged and vacant for the next several years before renovations finally began. This would only lead to skeletal remains being uncovered from beneath the floorboards and within the yard as well. There were several reports of people hearing cries and screams coming from inside and ghostly figures being seen on the balconies. Despite the fines and paranormal reports, renovations continued. Once completed, the mansion was turned into of all things, an all-girls school for African Americans. Now, either those people had no idea of the building's recent past, or they didn't believe in ghosts. Either way, this would prove to be a bad idea. 
Students reported being attacked within the school. Reports backed up with scratches, bruises, and whip marks. Whenever asked who did this, the students always reported that woman. The school was ultimately shut down, and later the building was converted into apartments. This didn't change things for the apparent ghost of Delphine LaLaurie, though. New tenants of the apartment began reporting attacks, as well as the ghostly apparitions of a naked man bound in chains. Another resident reported a dark figure of a woman standing over a baby's crib. One tenant was murdered in his apartment, in what appeared to have been a robbery gone wrong. The apartment was trashed, as if someone had been looking for something. The strange thing is, though, when friends and neighbors were interviewed, they all reported that the occupant had told them that he believed there was a demon in his apartment who wanted him dead. The LaLaurie Mansion has passed through multiple owners over the years, one even being actor Nicolas Cage at one point. Currently, the mansion is privately owned, and visitors or paranormal investigators are not allowed inside, although ghost tours in New Orleans will take you by the place to view it from outside while relaying the story of Delphine LaLaurie and the supposed current day hauntings. With a history as dark as this place, I have no doubt that people do encounter something at the LaLaurie Mansion. With the torture and suffering, deaths and mutilations that took place here, negative energy seems to be the bedrock foundation on which the mansion stands.